So Father, Lord, as we begin this time right now with you in, in the study of your word, God, I pray, Lord, would you, Lord, impact our, our hearts, Lord, would not just with your love and your grace and hope and mercy, Lord, but impact us, Father, with power, Lord, and assurance, Lord, of, of your hand being upon us and of our salvation. And so, Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we just praise you for being a loving, merciful God towards us. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. All right, you guys. Hey, I hope you have your Bibles. All right, man. Open them up to 1 Timothy in chapter number one, as I mentioned, and verse number 18 is where we're going to be started. And, and, you know, over these past several months, guys, there's been a couple of words that, you know, I was thinking of right? Like, like quarantine, right? This is a word that we, you know, all of a sudden it seems like our society is being used to hearing quarantine. You got to go quarantine yourself, right? Um, or isolation, go and isolate, you know, uh, social distance. There's another word that, you know, what, what's up with that socially? Hey, if you got to be socially distant from people, hey, I get it. I think, you know, we understand all that, but don't be spiritually distant from Jesus or his people. Some of you, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a thing right now where if we're spiritually distant, that means we're drifting away. Let's not drift away. Right? But these are some terms that we've heard of, right? Um, how, how about this other term? How this other word? Mask. Right. In other words, mask that we hear, you know, we, we have our mask, you know, how many of you get out of your car, you're going down to the market and you get to the market, the doors open and everybody looks at you like, what are you doing? And you're like, oh man, I forgot my mask. Right. And you got to walk all the way back. I know I get it. it happens to me all the time. You know what I trip out on is like the facial expressions of not everybody, but of some people, you're just kind of walking, minding your own business and you're about to enter into the building and people are like, their eyes kind of get big, you know, over through their mask. You know, it, I just like, man, people are, it, it's funny. You know, I don't know. Maybe they're not thinking anything. Maybe it's just me. I can't tell because there's a mask on their face. You know what I mean? Anyways, um, you know, I get that kind of a mask, but listen, let's not wear a spiritual mask. Okay. Um, that's, that's, you know, the Bible calls that a hypocrisy, right? And so let's not, that's like a two face. Let's not have that kind of a mask. But if you have like a medical mask, Hey, we get it. Right. Um, you know, I was listening to this radio station and they were saying that the most, um, like, I guess the most popular word, I don't know if I forgot how they put it, but they said the most popular word right now for 2020. And I was thinking probably it's got to be quarantine or something like that. No, it, it was lockdown, you know, and it's like, man, and who like, no one likes to hear those words, right? Lockdown. But that's, but again, these are some terms that we're kind of getting familiar with. And there's another term that I, we're all familiar with is essentials, right? Essential. And uh, today we're going to look at, you know, what is essential for the battle, Essential, so spiritual, I guess you can say, spiritual essentials for the battle, okay? And what is it, like what is essential for us? Now the battle I'm talking about, guys, is the spiritual battle. And so what is essential for you and I in this, in the, in, for us to be engaged in a battle and to battle well, if you will? Okay, what are those essentials that we do need? Now, as we get into Timothy, if you remember, it, the person who's writing this letter or this part of the Bible is Paul, the apostle. He's writing to Timothy. And really, as we begin in chapter number one, as we, we, uh, we looked at on, on Tuesday, and again, I want to say this too, as a reminder to everybody, you know, please, uh, man, uh, Connect with us on Tuesday nights because we're going through Timothy, all right? And it's just going to be so much better if you're getting the verse-by-verse -verse teaching of Timothy on a Tuesday night. And then on Sunday, when we look at a portion of what we went through, it'll help, you make, it'll help make more sense in your, in your minds of, of what's going on here in this chapter. And so if you're with us on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, we, we were kind of looking at here and, and um, how, how Timothy, or excuse me, how Paul wants Timothy to take this call 
seriously because there was a lot of false teaching that was going on. And so he uses this word charge. I charge you. We're going to look at that in a second. You know, so Paul really wants Timothy to take this call for him of him being a minister to take it seriously. Right. And my desire, guys, my, my plan and my desire, my prayer actually, is that all of us here, you know, that as we go through this today that we would, that I would be able to develop some practical um, application for us to understand and do to take our call as a Christian seriously because the battle is real and there are some essentials that we just need to be reminded of in this battle. Okay. And so a couple, a few things that we're going to be taking a look at. Okay. Three points that we're going to take a look at. Number one is that we're going to see, we're going to look at it, that it's essential to know that you have a purpose. Okay. It's essential for you to know that you have a purpose. Okay. Point number two will be, it's essential to understand the battle. Okay. And number three, the essential tools to prevail in the battle. Okay, and so we're starting at verse number 18. Look at uh, chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, and this is what it says. I'm going to read verses 18 and 19. It says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. By rejecting this, and we're going to take a look at that towards the end, by, but, you know, just some rejecting those essentials have made their faith, their faith ended up in a shipwreck. Friends, listen, I don't want any of us, myself or anybody, or you, I don't want you to end, end your, your faith to end up in a shipwreck. And so here, point number one, it's essential to know you have a purpose. Now, the word charge here, as we look into this, as, as Paul writes, he says, Timothy, I, he says, I charge you. He says, this charge I entrust to you. The word charge is a military term, okay? And so these are like orders from a high-ranking official or from a higher official, okay? And, and so remember, the Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he does have apostolic authority, okay, that was given to him. And again, we looked at this on Tuesday when the hands were laid on the Apostle Paul and Barnabas there in chapter number 13 in the book of Acts, all right? And so here with this apostolic authority that the Apostle Paul has, he is charging, he's giving these orders here to Timothy. And he wants really Timothy, as he begins to, you know, with these orders, to be a faithful teacher of sound doctrine because the battle there, the, the, the issue was that there was a lot of false teaching that was going on. And so he's, he's giving him this charge. And he says these words of, he reminds Timothy there, as you see there in verse number 18, um, that it, what these, this charge that is in accordance to the prophetical word that was spoken over Timothy's life. Okay, and so Timothy here, Paul is reminding him of that prophetical word that revealed his that revealed that his life had purpose. The prophetical word that was given to Timothy revealed to Timothy that, hey, Timothy, you belong to Jesus. You're saved. You're going to heaven. But there's also a purpose that God has upon your life. It was given to him through that prophetical word. Right now, this word of prophecy that was given to Timothy wasn't just to remind him, but it was also used to encourage him. You see, the reason why there was going to be a need for some encouragement, you and I know this because you and I, we need encouragement ourselves, right? You see, Paul is telling Timothy and reminding him and, in, and using this, this prophetical word that was spoken over him to encourage him because serving the Lord 
isn't easy. And it wasn't easy, it wasn't going to be easy for Timothy because he had a lot of obstacles. You know, he was, he was a young guy, he was a new guy, and, and you know, there was already, you know, like, like these, these false teachers that were there that were going to come against him and all these things. And so he was going to need encouragement, you see? Now, serving God or any, it's not, it may not be easy, guys. Serving the Lord and being a Christian and, and living our lives with a desire to honor God, it, it may not be easy. Okay, but well, check it out. But it doesn't have to be hard. I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense, right? Right? It may not be easy, but it doesn't have to be hard. You know, and I think how it's not hard in our lives for us to live it out is when we're reliant upon the Holy Spirit. God, I know that you have a plan and a purpose in my life as a Christian, as a, as a person that's, that's born again, and, and you want me to shine brightly. But Lord, it's not easy, but I'm depending on you. Because I know that that's that purpose there, but I'm depending upon you to help me to, you know, with the power of God's Holy Spirit. You see, and when we are reliant on the power of God, the Holy Spirit, it may not be easy, but it's not hard. Be why? It's because we're not doing it in our own power, our own strength. We're, we're, we're functioning, we're living our lives under the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And friends, I'm telling you this, listen, we shouldn't, Run, don't like, don't run away from that call upon your life to be a Christian. Now, you see, we all, like my life, my, I really believe, I really see my life, friends, as my life, I have a call upon my life from God to be a faithful Christian, to be a born again believer in Jesus Christ, right? And with that, this specific call that God has put on my life is to be a pastor, right? And for some that may not be a pastor, it could be an assistant pastor, it could be a youth leader, it could be serving in children's ministry, it could be, you know what, my ministry is there in my workplace where I'm, I'm doing Bible studies or I'm, I'm doing prayer times there in my workplace during lunch or something like that. You see, that's that call that God has put on your life. Don't run from it. Don't run, especially from the call of God of being a faithful Christian, Remember this in the gospel of John. Remember this. Jesus chose you. It says this in the gospel of John, chapter 15, verse number six, 16. He says this, Jesus, these are his words. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Watch this. Underline that part in your Bibles. Jesus says, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Okay, we're God appointed and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask of, ask the father in my name, you may have it. And so guys, listen, our purpose, our purpose, again, you know, it's essential to know our purpose. What is our purpose? Our purpose as Christians is to bear fruit, is to be fruitful, is to shine for Jesus. Listen to these words. Write this down if you can. God has appointed you and you can be sure that he will enable you to fulfill that purpose. God has appointed you. Okay? If he, and if he has appointed you, you can be sure that he's going to enable you to fulfill that purpose. To bear much fruit. And just like how Jesus says that, that our fruit would remain. And so here we see Timothy, he was being reminded and being encouraged by the prophetic word. Timothy, it's going to be hard, man. It ain't going to be easy for you. But let me tell you, don't, don't ever forget that word that was spoken over you. And let that word, not only, don't, only, don't, let it, uh, don't only rem remember it, but let it encourage you. Because when you're faced with those difficult times, you can say, you know what? No, God has called me here. I'm not going to give up. There's challenges in our world today. You are faced with challenges. I'm faced with challenges. You know, as I said in the beginning, you know, there's these crazy words that we're, you know, being familiar with and getting used to hearing, you know, isolation, quarantine, lockdown, coronavirus, you know, man, 
it, it's, it's, it's like, it's challenging. Let's not lose sight of that purpose and let's be encouraged because not only is it a prophetical word also for you and for me, my friends, but we also have the written word of God. Not just the prophetical word that's been spoken to us, but the written word of God encouraging us. The written word of God, uh, the written word of Jesus who says, listen, I chose you. Imagine that. God chose you. God chose me, right? And he appointed me. And that means there's a purpose upon my life. There's a purpose upon your life. Guys, let's fulfill that purpose. Let's be reminded of it. And let's be encouraged that it was God who spoke that. That we can go and bear much fruit, be fruitful. And, and whatever that may look like, you know, that can be today. You know, showing up today. We're going to give out food today. Or, you know, or tomorrow. Or there's Monday through Friday. We work in the schools. We do so many things. It's fulfilling that purpose. No, let's, let's, it's essential to know the purpose of God upon our lives. Point number two here. It's essential to understand the battle. It's essential to understand the battle. Always, number one, guys, number one thing. It is essential to understand the battle. And here's the number one thing that we need to understand. It's the Lord's battle, not ours. Amen? So that's the, I think that's at the top of the list. Let's, let's always remember that. Let's always understand, you know what? It is the Lord's battle. Listen to what, a couple of passages here in the Old Testament. In Exodus, in chapter number 14, verse number 13 through 14. Please write these down because I want you to go back and look at these verses. This is what it says. It says, and Moses, Exodus chapter 14, and Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today... You shall never see again, again, watch this, the Lord will fight for you. Underline that in your Bible, please. That's got to be underlined in your Bible. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Like, you don't got to say anything, man. You don't got to go out there and do all this and say this and do these tweets and, you know, go on your social media and put this up on Facebook. You don't got to, man, check it out. The Lord's going to fight your battles. All you got to do is be silent. Zip it. You know what I mean? And trust the Lord. This was during the time when, when, when the Egyptians were, were following the, the children of Israel through the, through the Red Sea. And the children of Israel were freaking out because they, were, they seemed to be trapped. And Moses was like, hey, children, you know, people of Israel, Israelites, chill out. God will fight for you. And, and there's another passage here in 1 Samuel. Write this passage down too. Now these are passages to, to show us and to illustrate that the battle is indeed the Lord's. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 47. Now we went through this several months back. And there in 1 Samuel chapter 17, this is the whole story of David and Goliath. Okay, David was a young guy and Goliath, you know, he was a giant of a man, almost 10 feet tall. Okay, and he was a, of, of the Philistine army, and he was challenging, you know, day after day, challenging the Israelites, and, and just really pretty much clowning the Israelites, putting them down, because the Israelites, watch this, they were afraid. They were fearful to go out into the battle. They were afraid. They are, ah, no, I'm going to isolate, man. I'm going to stay. I ain't going to go around there. I'm going to stay back here. They were afraid. And then David comes along and, you know, he hears all the, the yelling from Goliath. And he's like, hey, who is this guy? And they're like, oh, man, you know, this, where everyone's afraid, you know. And, 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 he, and he's just like, why is everybody afraid of this uncircumcised Philistine? I'll go and fight him. You know, and David was just a young guy and Goliath, 10 feet tall, a champion, the Bible tells us. He was a champion warrior. And David goes out and, and I love you know, we all know the story of David and Goliath, but here in this verse, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47, it says this, that, he says, it says this, that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and spear, 
for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. That's what David said to Goliath. He said, you know what? God doesn't save with a sword and a spear. You know, it's not going to work that way like what you think it is. For the battle, he says, it's the Lord's and everyone's going to know it. Every, see, God's going to get all the glory out of all of this, right? It's, under, it's essential to understand our battle, guys. You see, Moses and David, they understood. They understood. It was, it was essential for they understood the battle, that it was spiritual, and that God was going to get all the glory and you know their understanding, how their understanding was developed? Their understanding developed in this way because they spent time with the Lord. They spent time. You know, they spent intimate time with the Lord. And it wasn't just on Sunday mornings or, or you know, once or twice a month. It was a cons they were consistent. They were spending time. That was their life. Their life was spending time with God. Now, yeah, they also did other things. They worked and they had fun and they enjoyed. They had families and all this other stuff. But they spent time with the Lord. The Lord was with them through all of that. You see? And others... Well, we see like the Israelites, the Israelites, they were afraid. We're going to die out. Mo, you know, Moses, what did you do? We're going to die out here. They were afraid. They were fearful of their circumstances that they saw in a, in a sense, like a physical realm. The Israelites, when they were there and the, the Philistines were on the other side, all those other Israelite warriors, they were afraid. They were fearful to go out. They said, no. We're not going to. We, they were afraid. You know what they, they were? You know what fear does? Fear crippled them. Fear paralyzed them. The Israelites, we see this. It's, it's illustrated for us in the passages. Guys, again, go and look and read Exodus chapter 14 and read 1 Samuel chapter 17. Read about that and, and just observe the Israelites, how, how paralyzed they were because of fear. Because they didn't under, quite understand that the battle was a spiritual battle. There are so many other Bible passages that talk about war and, and warfare, okay? But not in the sense how we think of war and warfare, right? We think of war and warfare, you know, where there's missiles and bombs and planes and tanks and all that other stuff, you know? But listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter number six. Now in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter six, verse 12 the Apostle Paul, he says this, he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, it's, that's war, but it's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians. Write this one down. 2 Corinthians in chapter number 10, verses 3 through 4, it says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. So in other words, like we live in this world, we walk in the flesh, we're, you know, we have walk in the flesh, but the war that we have as Christians, as believers in God through Jesus Christ, we understand that the war that we're engaged in is not according to what we see and, and what's going on or what we hear in these, in these elements. It's something greater, man. It says this, for the weapons, it goes on to say, 2 Corinthians and, uh, chapter 10, verse 4, it goes on to say, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. I don't know about you, my friends, but that right there, man, I get encouraged. It's like, man, I just, man, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to get Pentecostal with all that right there. You know what I mean? It's like the weapons of the warfare that we're engaged in, it's not of this world. They are divine. In other words, they're from heaven, given by God for you and I, right? With power, right? For what? To destroy strongholds. Man, 
you know, I have a friend of mine, his name is Kevin Brown. And, and I was, I texted him the other day and, and, um, you know, I just wanted to say hi to him. And, and he's a pastor, he's a servant of the Lord. You know, he's a great, you know, he's a great man. And, um, and every time he sends me a text, like his little, you know, his little signature at the end of the text is, he says this, be dangerous to darkness. I love that. Every time I see it, man, every time he sends me a text message, you know, he'll say what he needs to say. And at the bottom, he'll say, be dangerous to darkness. I'm like, yes, right? How are we dangerous to darkness? Well, I, well I'm just a man. You know how we're dangerous, you know how I get to be dangerous, how you get to be dangerous to darkness? As number one, we, we, we have to have a real good understanding, right? It's essential to understand the battle. I understand the battle. It's spiritual. And I can be dangerous in darkness because as I pray, you know, as I, I'm, you know, in the spirit, right? Because it's not of the flesh, right? There's that divine power to pull down, right? To destroy the strongholds. It's important that we engage in that and understand, my friends, it's essential for us to understand the battle that we are engaged in. You know, and, and again, as I said, you know, it, it's, it's a spiritual thing. It's, that's the main thing. Understand, my friends, the, the warfare, the battle, it is, it is spiritual. And I got to tell you that there are many in the church, there are many in the church, many people in the church, maybe perhaps even some of you right now that are with us right now and you know, that, that the focus, the focus, there's too much focus on the physical battle. There's too much focus on that. There's too much of an emphasis on that. There's too much of, a, of energy spent to, to correct that when, listen, that's not the battle. The battle's spiritual, right? It's not political, it's not this side or that side. And, and now listen, I, I don't think that we should neglect, you know, opportunities and, and responsibilities that we have. But at the end of the day, my friends, it's all about us as Christians understanding. And it's essential for us to understand that it's a, it's a spiritual battle and not be consumed or too focused on the physical battle. Right? Again, as I said, it's essential to understand it's spiritual because when we do, we will, when we understand that, we will then spend more time with the Lord and we won't be overcome with fear or intimidation like what was going on with the Israelites when they were being chased by the Egyptians or when they were face to face with the other army of the Philistines. They were, you know, they were fearful. They were intimidated. See, when we understand that we're not, listen, it's not, we're not going to be stupid. We're not going to be dumb, right? God, Christians, you know, full of the Holy Spirit aren't dumb, right? But we're not fearful either, right? And, and so it's just, it's engaging in the battle. And my friends, let me tell you something. You know this right now. There is a spiritual battle that's waging right now. And, 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 and some, want to, some are seeing it as more of like a political battle and all this when it's not. It's a spiritual battle right? It's a spiritual battle. And we of all people need to understand that. See, and when, when we do this, when we're, when we have that understanding, we will engage, we will engage in the battle. We will engage with wisdom. We will engage with confidence that God will get all of the glory. You know, I, I really believe that it's not going to, it's not going to stop us. You know what I mean? And I've heard this, guys. I'm, I know I'm spending a little bit of time right here. We're going to get to point number three here in just a second. But I've, heard, I've had conversations with individuals where it's like, you know, man, I, I, I can't do this. I'm not going to go out here. You know, I'm not going to. And it's like, dude, I, I don't know. I can't do that because building my faith is essential. Like, like going to work. It's essential. I got to go to work. I, you know, you got to go to work. You got to go get, you got to get paid, Right. That's essential. Well, I, I say, you know what's out? What else is e essential? Probably even more than that is building my faith. And part of building my faith is, is not, there's not living my faith in fear or intimidation, but it's living my faith, you know, with wisdom and confidence. And because when I'm doing that, I understand the war. I understand the battle. When I'm doing that, I'm living my life out there like that, again, with wisdom and confidence, you know what's going to happen? God's going to get all the glory. 
Look what happened with the, you know, with, with Gideon. You guys remember that story with Gideon? And, and you know, there was the, 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 the army, the Midianites, they were there. It's the stories in the book of Judges. You can read it. It's an amazing story. And, you know, there were thousands and thousands. They, the, the children of Israel were outnumbered. Okay, crazy outnumbered, right? And so the children of Israel, they had, you know, from 10,000 down to 3,000. And then all of a sudden, you know, Gideon looks around and he's like, there's only 300 men against thousands and thousands of the Midianite army. And it's like, we're going to lose. And, you know, and there was so unconventional of how the Lord instructed Gideon to lead his people, right? Just to go and make a bunch of noise, a bunch of racket, right? You see, the whole point there is that God gets all the glory. God, it's his battle. It's a spiritual battle. And when, you know, and so the, from thousands of people, right, that the Israelites had under Gideon's leadership, it dwindled down, it dwindled down to only 300. And God did some amazing things. You know, let's, why don't you be a part of that 300, you know, be a part of the 300 with us that, that week that God will do amazing things through us. And we do that by understanding what, you know, the understanding the battle, that it's a spiritual battle and trusting the Lord in it. Now, point number three here, look with me at verse number 19. So Paul, you know, he says to Timothy, hey, it's a, you know, um, you know, just from the prophetical word that's spoken over you, right? That you may wage the good warfare, right? Understand the war. Understand, uh, it's essential to understand the battle. And he says this, in verse 19, holding faith and good conscience by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck their faith. So essential, the, the essential tools to prevail in the battle. Okay, essential tools to prevail in the battle. Now we need this, right? We need tools, we, do, we, we engage in the battle, but it's like, okay, what do I, how do I fight? What do I do, right? What do I need? Now, remember, it's a spiritual battle. So what are these spiritual tools that are essential for us to prevail, to be victorious? Well, it's faith and a clear conscience. These are essential, okay? Faith and a clear conscience are the kind of tools that are, you know, they, you don't have one in this hand and one in the other hand. Th these, these tools are attached together, kind of like a hammer. You know, you got a hammer on one side, you can hammer nails. On the other side, you can take out nails, right? They, they serve two purposes, right? But they're attached, they're together. Well, faith and a good conscience is in that sense. They, they, they are attached together. They go together. So let me talk about faith here for a second. Faith in Jesus enables us. Why is, why is it essential, right? Faith. Because faith in Jesus enables us to stand. Faith in Jesus enables us to stand. Faith in Jesus supplies the weapons needed for the battle. Okay, remember that out of Ephesians chapter number six. Okay. And it's faith in Jesus. It's... Faith in Jesus, friends, listen, is, it's not just something that we proclaim, right? Faith in Jesus is something we practice. Faith in Jesus is what we practice. We just don't, we don't only proclaim it, we practice it, you see? So our faith, your faith, my faith, right, individually, and also our faith collectively together in Jesus as Christians is reflected it should be reflected in our lifestyle, how we live, right? My lifestyle. I, I, and, and let me tell you something. People see our faith being lived out. And, and that's my question. Are people seeing your faith being lived out? And I got to tell you, you know, we're living in a world where there are people that are, they're longing. They're longing to see people of faith living it out with a genuine heart. They're searching for that. And, and you know that, and I know that, especially in the days in which we're living here today, it's, it's even more so, right? And so our faith in Jesus is, is, it should be reflected in how we live, right? In our lifestyle. And then we have the clear conscience, right? Faith's partner, right? The clear conscience. Now, 
Listen, I, I was reading this um, a mag, out of a magazine and this editor, um, Menken, Menken, he, he wrote this. He defined conscience. This is how he defined conscience. Listen, he said, the conscience is the inner voice that warns us that someone may be watching, right? Now, I got to tell you, when I, was, when I read that, you know, his definition of conscience, the inner voice that warns us that someone is watching, it's kind of like, well, that's kind of like a guilty conscience, you know? It's like, hey, something in there telling you, hey, someone's watching you. Oh, what are they, are they really, let me, you, know, you know, I don't want them to see me. You know, you're, kind of, you're trying to sneak away or do something, you know? There, there's some kind of guilt going on there, you see? Now, the person with a clear conscience will live out their faith regardless of who is watching, you see, so the person with the clear, so faith and a clear conscience, Paul tells Timothy, have these things. These are essential, right? Faith and a clear conscience, faith and a good conscience, because that good conscience is just like, dude, I'm about my father's business day in and day out, 24 seven. Yeah, I may engage in this and I do this. I work here. I have leisure time there. You know, I go over here. I like to go to this place. I go to that coffee shop. But you know what? And all of those places, I'm about my father's business. I don't, I don't have that warning, kind of like, oh, someone's watching you. You better clean it up, right? See, when we are about our father's business 24-7, right, in our homes, outside our homes, well, that, that conscience is going to be clear. You see, but here's the thing. It's like I'm doing those things because my faith is driving me to do those things. You see how these go hand in hand, faith and a clear conscience or faith and a good conscience? You see, the person with that clear conscience is going to live it out like that. I was reading this commentary. It's a great commentary. I really like it. He's, it says um, he's from uh, Patrick Fairbarian. I think I said his name right, Fairbarian. Um, the commentary, he said this about, a, about our conscience as Christians. Listen, he says this. A single flaw in the conscience is fatal to the believer's security. Nor can it be permitted to exist without gnawing like a worm at the root of faith itself. Now, I like that part right there. You probably see it there on your screen, right there where he says, nor can it be permitted to exist without gnawing like a worm at the root of faith itself. Like, you can't allow the flaws in our conscience to stay there because it begins to eat away at our faith. You know, and it's like that, those things that may, maybe those things that maybe perhaps we wrestle with, you know, that we battle with on an individual, personal level. You know, the, those things that really gets our, see, and friends, our conscience, it needs to stay right in the eyes of God because the more that we practice things that aren't pleasing to God, the more that we may practice sin in our lives without repenting, and confessing, and, you know, being transparent with God, and, you know, even spiritual leadership about those things that we struggle with. Let me tell you something. What begins to happen is the heart, and that little area gets hard, like a little callus, you know? You get those, and then you keep on rubbing that callus. What happens is that callus, it gets bigger, and bigger, and thicker, and thicker. The next thing you know, you have a huge, your whole hand is full of calluses, May that not happen to your hearts. Because, like it says right here, it's, if it's permitted to exist, it'll continue to gnaw like a worm. See, our conscience, friends, is an influence on our practice of faith. Your conscience, my conscience, it's an influence on our practice of faith. And our practice of faith influences a clear conscience. See, they go hand in hand. It's very important that we understand that. Faith and a clear conscience, friends, enables us to be an effective, to be effective in our spiritual battles. Faith and that clear and good conscience before the Lord, it, it enables us 
strengthens us to be an effective man or woman or an effective soldier of Jesus Christ in the spiritual battles that we engage in, not just on a you know, general battle, but on a personal battle. See, I know that like me, I have my own personal battles and many of those battles I've shared with you, you know, that I struggle with, you know? And, and I know that you have battles because we all do. But I want you to know that even in the midst of all those battles and even those battles that maybe we, we find ourselves like not advancing, right? Or not being, um, uh, uh, you know, victorious or not prevailing in. God loves you anyways. God loves you in that. Now, he, he loves us so much that he wants to pull us out of that by the power and the work of his Holy Spirit, but it takes us to be transparent with him too, right? That we don't go back to those things. That's just the love and the mercy of God. Because if we're neglecting to mind or we're, we're neglecting to hold faith, you know, have that grip, that death grip on faith. If we're neglecting those things, if we reject it, like how Paul says to Timothy, he says, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck their faith. Friends, let's not let our faith be shipwrecked, right? Without our faith being fed and our conscience being clear, our faith, your faith, my faith, it's, you know, my, my Christian walk will end up being a shipwreck. And I don't want any of us to engage in that. So how? Maybe right now God is speaking to you. And, and what is it that we do then? How, how, do we, how do we fix this? How do we... How do we acknowledge that the Lord is speaking to me, Pastor Tommy? What's going on? I, I, I want to make this right. I, I, you know what I love about the word? See, this God is not saying, hey, okay, so from now on, live a perfect life. Because we can't, right? We can't, man. We're, we're messed up people, man. We can't live a perfect, we're not, so it's not about living a perfect life, but it is about living a repented life. A life with the fruit of repentance. And so if these are some things that are going on in your life and you feel like, you know what, I, I want to get to, I want to get to that place, you know, uh, where I, I just, I, I want, I have an understanding, you know, my, of my purpose. And, and I understand that the, the battle is spiritual and I understand that I need these tools to engage. But I have these things going on. Listen to what the Bible says out of 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. And I'm going to end with this. The Bible says this. If we confess, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, that Jesus is faithful to cleanse us. In other words, those stains, those flaws in our conscience. Jesus is faithful to cleanse us of all of those things. That's his love. That's his mercy. And he says, son, daughter, get up, man. Dust yourself off. Get back in the game. Get back in the game. It's a spiritual battle. But listen, we are on the winning side. Don't live in fear. Don't live with intimidation. Live in the power and the work of the Holy Spirit, knowing that God has enabled us, enabled you to be effective in the task that he's called us to, right? He will enable us, and he enables us through the power and the work of his Holy Spirit and his love. Amen? Let me pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much for your kind heart, loving message of the word and the power and work of your Holy Spirit. And I pray, Father, that as we just close this time down right now, Lord, that, that we would truly understand, Lord, 
that we would understand, you know, that, that we would understand that it's essential to know, Lord, our, our purpose. And that purpose is to, or to bear much fruit. That we would understand, Lord, that the battle truly is spiritual. And that, Lord, that the tools, the essential tools to be victorious and prevail in, in this battle, in this life, Lord, is, is, is by trusting you, is, is faith and, and a clear conscience. And Lord, we get those because of you. Lord, it's, it's the faith that you give to us. It's, the, it's the, the clear conscience that you clear. Help us, Lord, to live a life that we can say, I'm about my father's business. If you're, right now you're with us this morning and, and, and you, just, you just feel like, you know what, God, I, I need to ask you to forgive me. I need you to, I just want to ask you to, to pour in your power. I, just, I need your help, Lord, because there's things going on in your life right now. Whatever they may be, God wants you to know God knows exactly what those things are. It may be a battle in your marriage with your children, your job, and be an illness, your finances, your home just relationships in general, or maybe you just personally, you feel like, man, you're lost and you're, you're just depressed and empty. I want you to know God loves you, man. He loves you. And if that's what's going on in your life right now, whoever you are with us, I want to encourage you, stand up to your feet right now. Just stand to your feet just right now. You might be by yourself. Stand to your feet. You might be with a group of people. Stand to your feet or with another person. Stand, please. Just acknowledge that before the Lord because God God wants to bless you today. He, listen, God loves you. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life, right? He's given us a future, a future and a hope, the Bible says. And maybe you just feel like you, you just need to ask God to help you with it right now. I want to pray with you, okay? I'm going to pray. So close your eyes. I'm going to pray right now for you. Father, Lord, for all of those that are, that are standing right now, God, you know who they are. You, you know what's going on in their life. And I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would fill them with the power and work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, if some that need a for, forgiveness of sin and rebellion, and if that's you right now, you've been sinning or you've been rebelling against God, I want you to just say these words. Say, say Jesus, forgive me of my rebellion. Lord, I pray that they would understand that as they confess that, Lord, that they are washed by the blood of Jesus and they are cleansed. That, that we all, Lord, can say, you know what? My conscience is clear before the Lord. I'm gonna be about my father's business. And so, Lord, would you bless every single person, those that are hurting with depression, Lord, anxiety and, and just uncertainty about life. Oh, Father, have mercy upon them, Lord, and give them, Lord, strength, Lord. Give them, Lord, what it is that they need in their hearts and in their minds, Lord. We thank you that, that Lord, your, your word tells us that, that you give us what we need. And so, Father... Bless them and bless us in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.